Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Present Tutor Seventh day Adventist Sabbath School Lesson Study. We are looking this week at sharing God's mission. We are truly happy that you have come by once again to study the lesson with us and to have an in depth understanding on what these meanings have coming from inspiration. This lesson is lesson four, and it is for October the 28th, Sabbath 2023. Let us go forward and see what we have on the Sabbath. But before we go through our memory text, I'm going to ask Sister Aiken to please give us that opening prayer. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. It's wonderful to be here again, brethren. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Father and our God, we are truly thankful for this wonderful privilege you have blessed us with. We thank the Lord for taking us safely through the many days that we have been separated from the brethren around the world. We are happy to be here again to mediate on their behalf to share this Sabbath school lesson with their people. We are asking for the Holy Spirit to come near unto us, to speak through us. Bless us, Lord, with clear vision, sound minds. Help us that we will speak thy words. May self be hidden in thee. May Christ alone be heard. May thy people be blessed and thy name glorified. We give thee thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. For this week, we are given our texts, all of our texts, that scripture text that we are going to go through, which is Genesis 18, Genesis, James 5, 16, Romans 8, 34, Hebrews 7, 25, Genesis 19, 1 to 21, and Genesis 12, 1 to 9. Along the way, we would be reading other texts that comes together, that enhances the lesson and bring out more from it. Our memory text is taken from John 13 verses 34 and 35 King James Version. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So here Christ is saying, all men are going to know that you are my disciple if you have love one for another. You know? And this does not speak about telling, just saying what love is. Love is an action, action word. This goes into action. Men will know that you are my disciple when you truly show love, which comes from the heart, right? We are told in the lesson that from the start, Abraham wanted to be used by God for mission. And the example that was given is from Genesis 18, which we are going to look at. Brethren, I know that we have looked at Abraham's life. We have looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. But as we go through the lesson again, we are going to have, you'll be surprised how much deeper this runs and how much more you are going to be understanding. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals a secret to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. And in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, his servant was Abraham. Abraham was resting during the heat of the day when he saw three travelers. Inspiration tells us Abraham had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them, was one whom he might worship without sin. And this is from Patriarchs and Prophet, page 138 and 139. You can read through that enti these entire pages. So among the three, the three guests that came to Abraham, Christ was among them. Our Lord, our Savior who died for us was among them. And inspiration made this clear to us. You know, brethren, yes, among these three travelers was our Lord Jesus. And inspiration tells this to us numerous times. And we're reading it here from Patriarchs and Prophets. 
little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. And we know that that is Christ. Let's continue. This reminds me when Jesus says, I was in prison and you never fed me. I needed clothing and you never clothed me. You know, sometimes you don't know who you meet. Sometimes they're angels in disguise, even our master. You see, John 13, 34. We're going to look at it. That's our memory text for this week that talks about the new commandment. Here what inspiration says on it in Acts of the Apostles. Christ had bidden the first disciples love one another as he had loved them. Thus they were to bear testimony to the world that Christ was formed within the hope of glory. A new commandment, he says, what I give unto you. He had said that he loved one another as I have loved you. Right? That he also loved one another. And at that time, when these words were spoken, the disciples could not understand them. But after they had witnessed the sufferings of Christ, after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension to heaven, and after the Holy Spirit rested upon them at Pentecost, they had a clearer conception of the love of God and of the nature of the love which they must have one for another. Because remember, Peter had told Jesus he loves him. He told him, one, I would die for you. But in that very same day, he betrayed him. We sometimes think we may have an understanding of love. But if that's not the love Christ is asking us to have, he wants them to have the love that he had showed them for that three and a half years. This love is the evidence of their discipleship. So without that love, we are not his disciples. When men are bound together, not by force of self-interest, but by love, they show the working of an influence that is above every human influence. Where this oneness exists, it is evidence that the image of God is being restored in humanity. That a new principle of the life has been implanted. It shows that there is a power in the divine nature to withstand the supernatural agencies of evil. And that the grace of God subdues the selfish inherent in a human heart. 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 4 to 8 reminds us that chariot suffereth long and its kind, chariot envieth not, chariot vaunteth not itself, it's not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, beareth all things. Believe it all things, hope all things, endure it all things. Chariot never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. My brothers and sisters, we have the example of our master. Shall we not follow? So why is it called a new commandment? Jesus said to them, a new commandment I give unto you. The disciples had not loved one another as Christ had loved them. They had not yet seen the fullness of the love that he was to reveal in man's behalf. They were yet to see him dying on the cross for their sins. Through his life and death, they were to receive a new conception of love. The commandment is to love one another was to gain a new meaning in the light of self-sacrifice. In the light shining from the cross of Calvary, they were to read the meaning of the words, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. We know that God's mission, all that was done was to save humanity. To achieve his purpose, he has assigned each of us a part in fulfilling that mission. Through the example of Abraham, we will study some of the ways in which we can share, share the mission, right? That God has given us to share. So in sharing God's mission, we are going to look at hospitality. 
love for others. Genesis 18, these two takes up Genesis chapter 18. Intercessory prayer, Genesis chapter 18. The mission results. Accept individual decisions. Submit to the divine will. And let us continue. So we are going to go over into Sunday's lesson in which Sister Akins is going to take us to the gift of hospitality. Sister Akins. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. Sunday, the gift of hospitality. And what a wonderful topic this is. Aren't we hospitable people? I hope we are. Many of us love to entertain. But let's see what happens with Abraham and hospitality. And let's see what inspiration has to say to us concerning the same. So we have been reading Genesis 18, 1 to 15. And the question is asked, what elements of hospitality are demonstrated in Abraham's response to his guests? So we'll be looking at that. And we'll also be looking at what principles of Abraham's example of hospitality can you emulate or can I, can we emulate in our own lives? All right, so we'll go forward and learn what the Lord would have. 1 to 15. Let's move forward. So let's read Genesis 18, 1, 2. We'll miss out some of the verses. We'll read 1, 2, 8. Let's read Genesis 18, 1 to 8. And it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in a tent door in the heat of the sun, in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to be to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man. And he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Wonderful. Abraham didn't know who these people were. But he ran after them and he entertained them. Do we do that today? Let's move forward and learn from inspiration. Yes, let's move forward and learn a little bit more about this incident or this event from inspiration. We're answering the question, what elements of hospitality are demonstrated in Abraham's response to his guests? So inspiration says from the book, Six Testimonies to the Church, volume, sorry, Six Testimonies to the Church, page 341, paragraph 2. And it reads, in the records of Genesis, we see the patriarch at the hot summer noonday resting in his tent door under the shadow of the oaks of Mamre. Three travelers are passing near. So Abraham was sitting in the shade in his tent door. It was about in the middle of the day for it says resting in his tent door at noontide. 
So inspiration continues, they make no appeal for hospitality, solicit no favor, but Abraham does not permit them to go on their way unrefreshed. He is a man full of years, a man of dignity and wealth, one highly honored and accustomed to command. Yet on seeing these strangers, he ran to meet them from the tent, from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Addressing the leader, he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And we read that in Genesis 18, 2 and 3, earlier on. With his own hands he brought water that they might wash the dust of travel from their feet. He himself selected their food while they were at rest under the cooling shade. And this is marvelous. This is a wonderful example for us today. Abraham did not wait for the travelers to ask any favor. He did not wait for them to say, Hi, I am thirsty. Can you give me a drink of water, please? No. He ran after them and he invited them in to have refreshments. Now, inspiration continues from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 138, paragraph 4. Abraham had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. And brethren, remember, repetition impresses the mind. We read this on a Sabbath's lesson, but it's important that we get it fixed in our minds. Abraham did not know who they were. He only saw them as three tired men walking along. But true, one of them was his Lord himself. Even though he addressed him as Lord, he wasn't certain. He didn't know who they were, but he addressed them that he addressed the leader as Lord. So inspiration continues. But the true character of the heavenly messengers was now revealed. Though they were on their way as ministers of wrath, yet to Abraham, the man of faith, they spoke first of blessings. Though God is strict to mark iniquity and to punish transgression, he takes no delight in vengeance. The work of destruction is a strange work to him who is infinite in love. Patriarchs and Prophets 138, paragraph 4. So let's move forward and we'll get a little deeper into this event or into this account. There's much for us to learn. Yes, the Bible lays much stress upon the practice of hospitality. Not only does it enjoin hospitality as a duty, but it presents many beautiful pictures of the exercise of this grace and the blessings which it brings. Foremost among these is the experience of Abraham, and we just read it. And now we are looking to see how best we can emulate Abraham's attitude. Yes? What can we learn from his attitude of hospitality? There must be something for us. So inspiration continues to say that Abraham was a true gentleman. In his life, we have the finest example of the power of true courtesy. Now this is a synopsis of Abraham's life, past, present, and future. Inspiration says, look at his course with Lot. How cautiously he welcomes the travelers. And we remember that Lot had chosen the best looking places for his himself and his animals. And he had left what he thought was a riffraff for Abraham, but he had gone to the wrong place. But nevertheless, he got into trouble there and Abraham thought well of him that he went to rescue him. So Abraham was very much in love with Lot. He did not take, you know, he did not retaliate at whatever Lot would have done. He acted like a gentleman. He acted Christ-like. So inspiration continues. How cautiously he welcomes the travelers, the messengers of God to his tent and entertains them. He bowed before the sons of Heth when he purchased of them a cave in which to bury his beloved Sarah. Well did Abraham know what was due from man to his fellow man. 
So Abraham practiced the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this is what we also need to do today. Inspiration continues from Adventist Home, page 445, paragraph 4. A lover of hospitality is among the specifications given by the Holy Spirit as marking one who is to bear responsibility in the church. Now, Abraham was the head of the church in his time. So Abraham knew exactly what God wanted him to do, and he did just that. Inspiration continues. And to the church, to the whole church, is given the injunction, use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift. So this is not a gift that is given to some, but to every man. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So here we are also reminded that whatever we have, we are only stewards. There is nothing that we can call our own. All belongs to God. So let's move forward and learn some more as we get into the details, more details concerning hospitality. Abraham has given us a very good example which we really need to emulate. Do not forget hospitality, for by it some have posted angels without knowing it. These admonitions have been strangely ne neglected. Reading from Adventist Home 445, paragraph 5. Inspiration continues to say, even among those who profess to be Christians, True hospitality is little exercised. Among our own people, the opportunity of showing hospitality is not regarded as it should be. And brethren, our own people here means you and I, us Seventh-day Adventists. And it's a shame on us that we have not been practicing hospitality as God intends us to. Do you know how many times, do I know how many times we have failed to to do good to Jesus as he passed by us in the person of those he died to save. Inspiration continues. There is altogether too little sociability, too little of a disposition to make room for two or three more at the family board without embarrassment or parade. Brethren, we need to take, take a deep look within our actions, in our minds. It begins in the mind. We need to make restitution. We need we need to reform our lives. We need to change our activities. In this way, we can become a blessing to those around us, an example to imitate. That is when we practice hospitality, when we invite others to have a little refreshment in our homes. Let's move forward and get into a little bit more details. And this will be our final comment on Abraham's hospitality or the gift of hospitality. And it says, it was Abraham's hospitality that brought such a great blessing to his home. His accommodating act of showing kindness to the heavenly guests who reaffirmed the promise of an heir and his accommodating act of showing them the way to the city by walking some distance with them, you'll remember he did that, caused the angels to confide to him their sad mission concerning Sodom. No home, therefore, should be forgetful of entertaining strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Do you know how elevating it was that God took Abraham into his confidence and said to him, Abraham, I am going to be destroying the city? Because the wickedness have come up before me. The cup is now full and running over. And as we get into more details further into the lesson, we will see just how Abraham responded to this knowledge. It didn't make him proud. It didn't make him feel as if he was better than everybody else. No, but as we get there, we will see just what attitude he displayed. And I pray, brethren, that we have been blessed and that we will 
consider entertaining strangers. Yes, these are serious times we're living in. When there are many, many out there, many unscrupulous persons who would harm us if we take them into our homes. But when we have a connection with God, even as Abraham had, we have nothing to fear for God will direct us and he will also protect us against the enemy's assistance here on earth. So may God bless us and help us to do his will. Over to you again, Sister Cherry. Thank you very much, Sister Akins. Um, that is so true because he has been reminding us to be hospitable. Even though we are living in a time that is so dangerous because he wants us to trust him and we are going to learn a bit more as we get into the lesson to really know what it means to really trust God and, Ab and about Abraham's experience in it. So we are looking at Monday. Abraham loves everyone. Do you believe that? Do you believe that every Abraham had loved everyone? This is our topic. It's based on Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. And we're going to look at these verses. And then we're going to see what inspiration say on them. And then we're going to meditate and take it in, right? How did Abraham exercise his great quality of love for all people without distinguishing tribe, ra race, or people? This is what we're going to look at. So we are going to get in and the questions that are asked in the lesson, we are going to answer them as we go forward. So the first question is, how did Abraham exercise his great quality of love for all people without distinguishing tribe, race, or people? So Genesis 18. We're reading the first few verses and then we're going to go to 20. And the men rose up from him and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. Verse 17 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? Verse 18 says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nation of the earth shall be blessed from him. This is a question. Keep in mind the question of the Sabbath school lesson so we could get the answer. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come upon me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Notice it is underlined and bold. Because we are looking at whether or not Abraham had a love for all people. Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. No, Abraham is saying, if there's 50, would you save them? And he went on. God says, then I will spare all the place for their sake. If there were 50, per venture, if there were five of the 50 righteous, lack, if they lack five of the 50 righteous, will you destroy the city? So he's bidding them down. God said he's not going to destroy it, right? In verse 30, it went down to 30. He said he won't do it if there is 30. And then it went down to 20. He said he would not destroy it if there's 20. And then he went down to 10. And he said if there is 10, he will not destroy the city. So here, God, here Abraham is not pleading for Syrian saints lots only. But he is pleading on behalf of the entire city. Would you not spare the city? So yes, Abraham not only pleaded for those who he think he loved, Abraham was thinking about others. Hear what inspiration say from the book, Christ Triumphant. We are told that Abraham drew near and said, will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? While Abraham had his true sense of humility, that every child of God should be should possess, yet he had an intense interest in the souls of sinners. 
So Abraham had an interest in the souls of sinners, not for a certain class. He is represented as drawing near. He steps close to those heavenly messengers and plead with them as a child would plead with its parents. He remembers that Lot had made his home in Sodom and that Lot had a connection all through Sodom by marriage. Therefore, Abraham commences with 50 and the Lord tells him that he will spare 50, spare it for 50, then he goes down to 10 and the Lord tells him that he would spare it for 10's sake. It says he does not make any further appeal, but he does hope that there will be found 10 righteous persons in Sodom. When Abraham reached to 10, Abraham didn't go any further. At least Abraham was thinking, yeah, man, they're going to find 10. He was hoping that 10, he don't think that they would have gone so bad that there wasn't even 10 righteous there. So Abraham was hoping that the city would be spared. So we see that Abraham indeed had love for others. He pleaded on behalf of the entire nation. Who was Abraham worried about? The righteous or the wicked? Abraham had the opportunity to meet the inhabitants of Sodom when he rescued them from the Chedlo Loma and accompanied them back to their city. And you will find that in Genesis chapter 14. He knew they were wicked. He also believed that they were other worship, others who worship in God. So not only did he believe that Lot and his family were worshippers of God, but he believed that there would have been other persons who know of the true God and worship him. And he believed that Lot would have been witnessing to them and they would have been growing. So inspiration says in Patreons and Prophet, Abraham taught that in that popular city, there must be other worshippers of the true God. And in view of this, he pleaded that be far from me, do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not judge of all the earth, do right. Abraham asked not once merely, but many times, waxing bolder as his requests were granted. He continued until he gained the assurance that if even 10 righteous persons could be found in it, the city would be spared. Do we have love in our hearts as Abraham did? For souls? If Abraham had not loved the wicked inhabitants of Sodom, he would have said, rescue my nephew. Do not let him perish with that wicked, with the wicked. But that wasn't what he asked for. We are to love others because God died for them. And there is still hope that at some time in their lives, they will accept salvation. Aren't we hopeful that the persons we see today who have not given their life to Christ to have them their lives be given to Christ? Now, the other question is, why is intercessory prayer so important in our life? How can praying for others in need help us grow spiritually and experience more than the reality of God's love for sinners? So let me just read the second part of it. How can praying for others in need help us grow spiritually? Right? This is what it is asking. It says, in his intercessory prayer for his disciples, he declared, the glory which thou givest me, I give them. Who is pleading here? Christ. Remember, Christ is our perfect pattern. And we have to follow the example he left. He has been pleading for his disciples even when they were here. Read John 17. Read from verses 9 to 20. And he's still pleading on our behalf in heaven. He says what? The glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me 
as thou has loved me. Love them as thou has loved me. This is from God and God's amazing grace. While Abraham was not in Sodom, he was not connected with Sodom, yet we see he had an intense interest that Sodom should not be destroyed if God would spare it. He was, I could imagine, think about it. You know God is going to destroy a city tomorrow. Now yeah, he's going to do a, destroy the city. And you believe that there may be righteous. You already plead if there be 10. What do you think Abraham might have been doing that night? He probably spent all night in prayer. Prayer and intercessing that there be 10. We are reminded. From inspiration, let us strive to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed, not only for himself, but for those who he was opposing. For those, sorry, who were opposing him. When he felt earnestly desirous that the souls that had trespassed against him might be helped, he himself received help. So let us pray, brethren. Not only for ourselves, but for those who have hurt us and are counting, continuing to hurt us. Pray. Pray, especially in your mind. Give not the Lord rest, for his ears are open to hear sincere, importunate prayers when the soul is humbled before God. So we stay here on a Monday and we go over to Tuesday's lesson. And Sister Akins is going to take us through. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. That was really beautifully done. I, I, I am just amazed, you know, at how how we are lacking and how the amount of examples, the witnesses, the cloud of witnesses, as the writer of Hebrews said, that we have, yet inspiration has said about us that we have done worse than they. So we are not really walking in the steps of Abraham, not yet. And we need to really get to that place because we cannot really make it to eternity unless we have that faith that Abraham had in his Savior or in our Savior. All right, so we're looking at Tuesday, Abraham's spirit of prayer. We just heard a little bit about Abraham loving people, and it's because he loved them when he prayed. We also heard much about that prayer too. Genesis 18, 23 to 32. Sister Cherry just read some of the verses. But as we turn the pages, we will read more. We are will we will read, repeat some of the same verses that has already been read because we have the same passage from Genesis 18. Then we have James 5 16. And we are asked, what should this teach us about the power of intercessory prayer? And we just heard a bit about intercessory prayer on the Monday. We'll also look at, at Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25. And we will learn what these verses tell us about what Jesus has done for us and how this truth might help us to understand better our own role as intercessors for others. So we'll move forward and we'll get into a little bit more details on Abraham's spirit of prayer. And we're looking at intercessory prayer. And I just want to say, brethren, um, the internet is somewhat unstable. So please bear with us for the slow um or the lapse in time for getting through. All right. So we're looking at intercessory prayer and 
We read James 5, 16, and it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, it says here, Upon hearing the sentence on Sodom and the surrounding cities, Abraham interceded with God on behalf of its unworthy inhabitants. And we read about that in eight, Genesis 18, verse 24. Surely among them there are fair people who do not deserve to die. Maybe 50, 45, 40, down to 10. Sister Cherry read that for us in Genesis 18, 25 to 32. Actually, there were four minus one. A lot, his wife, and their two daughters. They started out together, but unfortunately, Sister Lot didn't make it because she disobeyed the command. Anyhow, God spared an entire city, Zor, for their love. And we read about that in Genesis 19, 20 to 21. And we'll get more into that on the Wednesday's lesson. That was the answer to Abraham's intercessory prayer. We must intercede for those with whom we are in contact, not only for their physical needs, but also for their conversion. We must intercede just as Abraham intercede. We must love people just as our Savior loved us. Because he died for every one of us. Every one of Adam's sinful children caused Jesus to die on that cross. So let's move forward and get into more details. So let's read a few verses from Genesis 18 again. And we begin at 24 and it says, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, no, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, For adventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. For adventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, no. I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. For adventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. For adventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. So you see, we see here that Abraham was very persistent in asking. For he really loved the people. He loved their souls. And he wanted them to be saved. But let's get forward and see how it really ended. We already know. Some of us do know. But let us be reminded what took place in Sodom. For of course the Lord did not find ten persons there. We just told you a few minutes ago that there were only four. So let's read 
let's read on and see what more we can learn. This is really very interesting. Abraham pleading with the Lord. Can you imagine? Pleading with the Lord. So let us look at James 5 verse 16 and it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What should this teach us about the power of intercessory prayer? Inspiration says to us from Conflict and Courage, 51, paragraph 3. And the man of faith pleaded for the inhabitants of Sodom. Once he had saved them by his sword, now he endeavored to save them by prayer. And we remember that when the war was done there and Abraham went to rescue his nephew, he rescued a lot more than his nephew by the sword. So now, of course, God had helped him. So now he was praying on their behalf because the angels of vengeance had come to destroy the place. So inspiration continues. With deep reverence and humility, he urged his plea. Himself a sinner, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf. Such a spirit all who approach God should possess. Yet Abraham manifested the confidence of a child pleading with a loved father. He came close to the heavenly messenger and fervently urged his petition. So Abraham urged his petition in humility. He was not ordering God to save them, but he pleaded with humility and with love for God to save them if it was possible. As a matter of fact, to save the whole city if it was possible. So, continuing from Christ's triumphant 75 paragraph 4, inspiration says, The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The Son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. And we remember the prayer of Jesus in John 17. He prayed on our behalf. He who has paid the price for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul. With an antagonism to evil such as can exist only in a nature spotlessly pure, Christ manifested toward the sinner a love which infinite goodness alone could conceive. And we read that in Luke 23, 34. And yes, that reading came from Patriarchs and Prophets 140, paragraph 2. And now we read from Christ Triumphant 75, paragraph 4, and it says, here Abraham stands as one who is a representative for God and his history is brought down along the line to our time. So we, this has been recorded for our benefit that we may take a page out of Abraham's book and do likewise. That is what God is expecting of us. But let's move forward and see what more we have to learn about intercessory prayer and its benefit to us or how we really need to approach the situation of intercessory prayer. All right, so we'll read from Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25. And the question is asked, what do they tell us about what Jesus does for us? And how might this truth help us understand better our own role as intercessors for others? So Romans 8.34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is alive, that is risen again, sorry. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Let me repeat, Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Hebrews 7, 25 says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by, by him, 
seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And looking back at Romans 8.34, we know that when Paul wrote this statement, Christ was at the right hand of God making intercession. But now, since 1844, he is no longer at the right hand, but he is now standing before the Father, the great judge, pleading on our behalf, still making intercession. But now, as our advocate, he is pleading on our behalf. So we continue by reading the Zion of Ages 166.3. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that Scripture is from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, quoted by Inspiration in the Desire of Ages, page 166, paragraph 3. So we have no need to fear, for Christ, our high priest, had been tempted in all points as we are being tempted, but he is without sin. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy for the time of need, not for ourselves only, but for those around us. So we continue reading from Faith and Works 105, paragraph 4. From these scriptures, it is evident that it is not God's will that you should be distrustful, and that you means you and I. It is not his will that you should be distrustful or torture your soul with the fear that God will not accept you because you are sinful and unworthy. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 8. Present your case before him, pleading the merits of the blood shed for you upon Calvary's cross. Satan will accuse you of being a great sinner, and you must admit this, but you can say, I know I am a sinner, and that is the reason I need a savior. And we praise God for Jesus who died for our sins. If we had not sinned, then there would have been no need for Jesus. But we thank God that even though we sinned, God had not cast us off. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died to save us. I pray you have been blessed, brethren, as we move forward. Sister Sherry, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Akins, for taking us through Tuesday's lesson. We are going to go straight over into Wednesday. You know, this week we are talking about Abraham. And I want to believe that we are all learning something new and something deeper or even being refreshed. So now we are looking at Abraham's mission. That's the topic for Wednesday. And it's based on... Genesis 19, 1 to 29. And we are familiar with this account. If you have not read it, I, I advise you to please go back and go through it. This is the account of um, Lot in Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The text gives an interesting indication about the position of Lot in the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And we'll find this in Genesis 19.1. This means he was an important character in the city. Certainly a public officer because sitting in the gate is a privilege of officers, judges, and kings, etc. But we're going to go in and we're going to answer the question. The question is asked, what was the result of Abraham's spirit of hospitality, love, and prayer? And the key word right there is the result. Okay. Genesis 18, verses 2 to 4 says, And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray ye, you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. 
So here we have the account of Abraham's hospitality. Abraham has always been hospitable. And we know that Lot learned his experience from Abraham. Because we're looking at what the result of Abraham's hospitality. What Lot did in Sodom was a result of the hospitality that Abraham had showed to him and had taught him. He now has practiced it. Verse 1 says, There came two angels to Sodom at evening, even for even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. That is exactly what Abraham did. And he said, Behold, now my lords, turn in, I pray, pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early in the morning, early and go on your ways. And they said, nay, which means no, but we will abide in the streets all night. Verse three says, and he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and did they did eat. And this is exactly the experience that Abraham had. These wayfarers who were passing, wasn't passing so to go in Abraham's house. But Abraham insisted that they stayed. Just like Lot insisted that these men stay with him and he himself prepared meal for them. We're talking about the result. This result that Lot now shows to the angels, the two angels that came to Sodom, my brothers and sisters, we are seeing it is a result of what Abraham did. Exactly everything. Lot, Abraham's nephew, though he had made his home in Sodom, was imbued with the patriarch's spirit of kindness and hospitality. Seeing at nightfall two strangers at the city gate and knowing the angel, danger, danger sure to beset them in the wicked, in that wicked city, Lot insisted on bringing them into his home. And listen to what it says. Pay closer attention to the underlying words. He was imbued with the patriarch spirit of kindness and hospitality. This was a result of Abraham's hospitality and love and everything. To the peril that might result to himself and his household, he gave no thought. It was a part of his life work to protect the imperils and to care for the homeless and the deed performed in kindness to, uh, to, to two unknown travelers brought angels into his home. Those whom he sought to protect, protected him. At nightfall, he had led them to, for safety to his door. At the dawn, they led him and his household forth in safety from the gates of the doomed city. So we, we are seeing the similarities between Lot and Abraham. Sitting, waiting to entertain. Do we even think about that? They received the angels. They invited them to eat. They intercede with them. Brethren, Abraham's hospitality saved Lot because if Lot did not entertain those angels, maybe he would have been lost. Lot did not know the true character, but politeness and hospitality were habitual with him. They were part of his they were part of his religion lessons that he had learned from the example of Abraham, the result of Abraham, brethren. Had he not cultivated a spirit of courtesy, he might have been left to perish with the rest of Sodom. Many a, a household in closing its doors against a stranger has shut out God's messengers who would have brought blessings and hope and peace. Genesis nineteen fifteen and 16 says, and when the morning arose, then the angel hastened not, saying, Arise, take thy wife and the two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. 
if Lot didn't want to leave Salah, the angels would have told Lot the night before what would have become of the city and to go and gather his children and so forth and who he can and to save them. But Lot really did not want to leave Sodom. Lot was comfortable where he was. So what when somebody, when you invite somebody out and they don't want to go, you see they start lingering in the house. They they find the thing to do, they're moving slowly because they don't want to go. This was the experience of Lot. The angels save Lot. It says. In verse 16, and while he lingered, the men what? They lay hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, why was God merciful to Lot? They couldn't even find 10 righteous, righteous in Sodom. Verse 29 says, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. The angels saved Lot. Then again, we are seeing the results of what? Abraham's hospitality. It says what in verse 29, when God destroyed the cities, he remembered Abraham. That's the result of Abraham's life. His love for perishing souls and Lot and his two daughters were saved in mercy brethren this is a lot for us to ponder on now the same privilege that was granted Abraham and Lot is not denied to us so we too have to show ourselves hospitable okay by showing hospitality to God's children we too may receive angels in our dwellings even in our day, angels in human form enter the homes of men and, enter and are entertained by them. And Christians who live in the light of God's continents are always accompanied by unseen angels. Mark the fact, it says, note it, always accompanied. And these holy beings leave behind them a blessing in our homes. Always. I know of a few persons who have encountered with angels and not until the event happened and the angels disappear that they know they had an encounter with them. We are told in continuing Advent this home, these acts of courtesy God thought of sufficient importance to record in his word. And remember we said last week and also in the study that I did or with Moses' death. What is written in the word of God are not just there because they have a purpose. We, more than a thousand years later, they were referred to by ins the inspired apostles. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for, there are, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So that had passed on to the disciples. And it has come down to us. The Bible lays much stress upon the practice of hospitality. Not only does it enjoin hospitality as a duty, but it presents many beautiful pictures of the exercise of this grace and the blessings which it brings. Four more. Among these is the experience of Abraham. Brothers and sisters, Abraham's hospitality saved Lot. Abraham interceded for Sodom, but only three survived. Lot interceded for his sons, his daughters, and his sons-in-laws, but only two daughters survived. Was the intercession of these righteous men a failure? No. God will not, God will not save anyone against their own will. Salvation depends on each person's choice. However, intercessory prayer offers opportunities for change that would not otherwise be offered. And this is the experience Lot has. Abraham was interceding on Lot's behalf. But the angels still had to take Lot and his family by hand 
and take them out of the city. I want us to remember when these two angels came down to Sodom, Sodom had a time and day for its destruction. And the angels had to take, Lot and his family were lingering, they had to take them out in order to save them. Because God has specific reason, he had specific time for, for the flood, all the dates and the days and everything that happened specifically, they were there. There's a specific time when Sodom would have been destroyed. The, the family of Lot, Lot and his family had to get out before that time had come. There's a specific time for God to judge his people within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Judgment begins at the house of God first. There's a specific time for the judgment of the world. There's a specific time for everything, brethren. And I trust that you are all blessed by Wednesday's lesson. So I'm going to hand over to Sister Aiken to give us go to Thursday with us quickly. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. All right, so we're looking at submission to God's will on the Thursday. And we know that Abraham is a very submissive servant. So we have been told to read Genesis 12, 1 to 9. What do these verses teach about submitting to God's will, even when the path ahead does not seem clear? Now, when Abraham was called to leave Ur, he didn't hesitate. He was very submissive. So as we get into Genesis 12, 1 to 9, we will learn much more about submissiveness. One of the main qualities of Abraham was his submission to God's will. All the experiences of Abraham with God were characterized by this submission. His calling, Abraham received a challenge, a challenging call from heaven. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And as we said before, he never hesitated. Now this week we have challenges to face. But as we get further into the details, we will read for you and we'll remind you. And we hope that you had followed up on the challenge for last week. All right, so let's move forward and get more into the details of submitting to God's will. So inspiration tells us from thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 142. The victory is not won without earnest prayer, without the humbling of self at every step. Our will is not to be forced into cooperation with divine agencies, but it must be voluntarily submitted. So here we see that God will not force us to do anything that he asks us to do, but we must choose he has given us the free will, so it is our choice whether we want to obey him or disobey. Inspiration continues. Were it possible to force upon you with a hundredfold greater intensity the influence of the Spirit of God, it would not make you a Christian, a fit subject for heaven. So it wouldn't really do us any good because it isn't our choice. We would be murmuring and complaining, complaining all along the way. The will must be placed on the side of God's will, says inspiration. You are not able of yourself to bring your purposes and desires and inclinations into submission to the will of God. But if you are willing to be made willing, God will accomplish the work for you. But many are attracted by the beauty of Christ and the glory of heaven who yet shrink from the conditions by which alone these can become their own. Sometimes we say we love God, but when we are called upon to face a test, we begin to murmur and complain. We forget that if God is in control of our lives, then anything that happens to us is that which he alone allows. We forget these things so quickly. Inspiration continues. 
to renounce their own will, their chosen objects of affection or pursuit requires a sacrifice at which they hesitate and falter and turn back. Many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Brethren, we are the ones who doubt. We are the ones who hesitate. Like Lot, we hesitate when God calls us to leave situations that are not really good for us. I pray we will not be found among those who will seek to enter in and are not able. I pray that we'll take fast hold to the strength of Jesus and determine in our hearts like Abraham to do whatever God says we are to do because it is the voice of God we know that is speaking to us. Let's move forward and learn something more about submission to God's will. Read Genesis 12, 1 to 9. Let us read these verses and see what we can learn about submitting to God's will. And it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse at thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. Who appeared unto him, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east, and there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. So here we see Abraham entering into the land of Canaan. But God said, to thy seed will I give the land. You notice? God didn't say to thee, but to thy seed. And it didn't bother Abraham. For Abraham knew that he was just a sojourner. He was only passing through. He was really looking for a better country. But Abraham continued to journey through the land. And so as we move forward, we learn We'll get into more details on submission to God's will. Abraham submitted to God's will. He never murmured. He never complained. He just went where God wanted him to be. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, the best place for Abraham is the place where God wanted him to be. And that should be our desire too. The best place for us should be the place where God wants us to be. We need to be submissive to God's will, even as Abraham was submissive to God's will. So Abraham's unquestioning obedience was one of the most striking instances of faith and reliance upon God to be found in the sacred record. With only the naked promise that his descendants should possess Canaan, without the least outward evidence, he followed on where God should lead, fully and sincerely complying with the conditions on his part and confident that the Lord would faithfully perform his word. The patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He passed through wilderness, through wildernesses without terror. So here it's not just a wilderness, but more than one 
he went through. And we know that wildernesses contain wild animals, animals that may, may attack human beings. But, but Abraham was not fearful. The patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He passed through wildernesses without terror. He went among idolatrous nations with the one thought, God has spoken, I am obeying his voice. He will guide, he will protect me. And that reading came from Reflecting Christ 324 paragraph 3. So Abraham was certain that God would protect him. He knew God. And he was called a friend of God. And God said of him, and know that he will obey me. Yes. And he, he knew also that he would command his household after him. Let's move forward and learn some more about submitting to God's will. Abraham is a great example to us. We truly need to practice submission to God's will, just as Abraham did, trusting God, believing in his word. Yes, taking him at his word. That's what he expects of us. So continuing reading from Reflecting Christ, paragraph four of the same page, just such faith and confidence as Abraham had, the messengers of God need today. That's you and I, brethren. But many whom the Lord could use will not move onward, hearing and obeying the one voice above all others. The Lord would do much for his servants if they were wholly consecrated to him, esteeming his service above the, the ties of kindred and all other earthly associations. So the reason that we doubt God is because we do not really love him enough. We do not love him with all our heart. We love our neighbors, we love our brethren, we love our family more than how we truly love God. But these people whom we love, they are failures, brethren. Let us remember, the Bible tells us that the arm of flesh will fail us. But God will never fail. He is the one who created us and he died again to redeem us from sin. So may we make some decided effort to put our confidence in God and in him only and not in those around us. Let's go forward into more details. Submission to God's will is what we're looking at. So how do we submit to the divine will? Genesis nineteen twenty-seven to 28 says, And Abraham went up in the morning, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and lo, the smoke of the country went up like the smoke of a furnace. So this is the morning after the angels had spoken to Abraham. When God called him to go to Canaan and be a blessing to the world, Abraham obeyed. Genesis 12, 1 to 5. He did not ignore the call, nor did he give it any ifs or buts. Having to separate from his nephew, he let him choose the territory, throw, sorry, knowing that God would fulfill his will in any case. So when there was quarrel between the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham, Abraham allowed Lot to choose. And Abraham knew that whatever was left for him, God's purpose would still be fulfilled. God had promised the land to his posterity and he knew that it would still be fulfilled. No matter what Lot chose, no matter what was left for him, the promise would be fulfilled. So now we're looking at Genesis 19, 27 to 28. After his intercessory prayer for Sodom, Abraham left the next morning hoping to see his request fulfilled. But what he saw was destruction. There were no complaints from him. Once again, he submitted to the divine will. We must always accept God's will, even if it differs from ours. And most times it will. God's will sometimes is something that may look crazy to us. But once God has spoken, we should obey. 
and we are getting further into the final details of submission to God's will. Virgin, I hope these lessons is enough to help us to reform our lives. We are God's last day servants. And God's intention for us is that we should enter into the heavenly Canaan. He called Abraham to Canaan. He said, I will give this land to thee. Then he said, I will give it to thy posterity. And it came down the land to the patriarchs. What will we do, brethren, knowing the final days of earth's history? Will we allow this heritage to slip from us? I pray not. May it be our desire, as intense as it is God's desire for us to enter, may it be also our desire to enter. And this is where we end for today. God bless you, Sister Cherry. It's over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Akins, for taking us through Thursday lesson where we are reminded that we are to submit to the divine will. And we have seen a, an example of Abraham's submission to the will of God. Wouldn't we submit today? Wouldn't we be obedient today? Obedient without even questioning. Wouldn't we just do what God asks us to do? So we are on the Friday. And we are told here, reading from the second paragraph, the spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He who has paid the price for, our, for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul with an antagonism to evil such as can exist only in nature spotlessly pure. Christ manifested toward the sinner in love which infinite goodness alone could conceive. In the agonies of the crucifixion, himself burdened with the awful weight of the sins of the whole world, he prayed for his rivalers, revilers, and murderers. He said what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Brethren, May we be reminded. I have heard many excuse themselves from inviting to their homes the hearts, to their homes and hearts the sins of God. Why? I have nothing prepared. I have nothing cooked. They must go to some other place. And at that place, there may be some other excuse invented for not receiving those who need hospitality and the feelings of the visitors are due to be. And they leave with unpleasant impressions in regard to the hospitality of these professed brethren and sisters. If you have no bread, sister, imitate the case brought to view in the Bible. Go to your neighbor and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to set before him. So we are, we don't have any excuse to entertain strangers, to entertain guests, to be hospitable. It is a requirement that the Lord is passing on us so that when angels come in the garbs of humanity, we will not turn them away and in turn, not receive the blessing we should have. So let us close here on the Friday and I will ask Sister Aiken to take us through our advanced challenge. And yes, brethren, but before I go to the challenge, I just want to say a little bit on hospitality. I like that comment that you read from Inspiration, that statement about asking bread from someone if a visitor should come and we do not have it then there must be someone we can ask for it 
You know the reason why we cannot really ask for many of us will not do that. It is because we do not love the way Jesus loves us. For if we were really loving each other the way Jesus loves us, there would be nothing too hard for us to ask of another, and that other would not be would not find it annoying if we should come to them asking. But you know what I noticed too? That the woman, the woman of Zarephtha, when she fed the prophet, her meal did not end. You know, it continued. It was multiplied. She had only enough left for her and her son. It is just showing us the, the blessing that comes from being hospitable. She had only one meal left in her, in her cupboard. And she even said it to the man. But she went and she made something for him first. She didn't give any of that to her son. She didn't eat any herself. But she gave it to the man of God. It wasn't that wonderful. Wasn't that some, isn't that something that we need to emulate, brethren? Yes, man, I think so. And her basket continued to produce by a miracle. God really wants to bless us in these ways. He wants to work these miracles in our lives. But we are too doubtful. May God help us to be really like Abraham, to really trust him to do for us the things that he wants to do for us. So our weekly challenge for next week, in our cities, we face obstacles to preaching the gospel appropriately and effectively. Perhaps in our little communities where we live, we do not have these challenges, or do we? Anyway, let's pray as we are admonished. We need to ask God to intervene, and surely we need that because we cannot work without him. Then the advanced challenge Find a way to connect with someone who is going through a difficult situation similar to yours. Tell the person you are praying for them and ask God to show you what you can do to help them. So we do not just pray for them, but we practice as well. Huh? We put our actions where our prayer is. For of course, we are the hands and feet that God has done here. And praying alone will not make a person warm. We have to give them the blanket or the coat or whatever, the food, to make them comfortable. So I pray that we will take up this challenge for next week. Now we'll have our closing prayer, as we say, bye from Sabbath school. Let us pray. Our loving Father and our God, we are truly thankful for these wonderful lessons that you have sent to us to help us to be Christ-like. Lord, we truly thank thee for the example of Abraham. We thank thee for having recorded it for us. Help us, Lord, that as we study these lessons, we will not only be hearers, but may we also be doers, so that thy name can be honored through us and our fellow men blessed. We give thee thanks again for hearing and for answering. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you, brethren. Bye from Sabbath school until next time.